All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, thank you so much for attending our panel discussion. Let me first introduce myself. I'm a financial news anchor for China Central Television. Prior to that, I was a financial anchor and reporter for CNBC. And before that, I was investment banker for Lehman Brothers. So my job for the past six, seven years has been talking to business people from both China and the Western world. There seems to be a really a tremendous appetite to do business in China and also a very wide understanding that there is a specific set of rules and cultural biases you have to understand in order to be successful in China. And when it comes to media coverage, there seems to be a very disparate dis depiction of what's going on in China. On one side, they'll say, you know what, China's economic model is fundamentally flawed. It doesn't work long term and China's economy will crash. On the other side, they seem to think China's economy is the prime example of how a government should be involved in the economy and China's super efficient, is overtaking the US, is overtaking the world when China ruled the world. Uh, in my personal opinion, I don't think neither of these uh, depictions is accurate. So to Today, hopefully, we are here to demystify China for you and ultimately, hopefully, to help you make money in China, a market with 1.3 billion consumers. So my first question, we have two investors here and two entrepreneurs here to answer all the questions you may have about entering into China. So my first question is to, uh, to two investors on stage. Let's start with Christina. Uh, if there's one thing an entrepreneur must know and have before uh, consider entering the Chinese market, what would it be? So, I mean, the Chinese market is traditionally viewed as too hard to do, and now is viewed as too big to miss. And there are a lot of things that, as you know, Tracy was saying, is uh, topics that are being mystified and made very complicated. Um, actually, the looking at the entrepreneurs that we've worked with in Europe and the US, one of the main things is really alignment and priorities within the organization that makes it hard for them to really have a big China push. What I mean by that is uh, obviously that um, when a business goes into a market like China, they will quite often be quite diligent and doing a lot of work in terms of like, understanding the market, knowing whether this is a market for them. Having done that, bring that knowledge back in-house internally, how do you make the, the entire organization go behind that vision is much more challenging. So I've seen businesses where the CEO is very ambitious and is a great visionary, uh, a great visionary talking about you know, reaching um, uh, great potentials in China, whereas the resources put behind is only 1% you know, of, of the dev team uh, dedicated to China features, etc. This is what really makes the execution much harder, and this is where really what we see um, probably where the most failure comes from when going to China. That's right. You really have to devote enough resources and human resources and capital yeah. in China in order, in order to be successful. And now the same question for you, Daisy. I know that your fund is backed by one of China's tech giants. So tell us about it. And what do you think about uh, what entrepreneurs need to know before entering into China? All right. Um, from our perspective, I see China apparently to be a very attractive market for a lot of the entrepreneurs because just simply it's enormous customer base and huge talent pools. But you know, entering to China takes a lot more um, than your home market. You need to you know, understand the regulatory, you need to find the channel, understand the cons customer's behavior, which are a lot different than what you're used to. But I think down to one single uh, thing that can assist your success and smooth entering China, I think finding the right partner finding the right local partner that can assist you, that is one single most important thing. Strategic partnerships is the key word here. Now my next question is for the two entrepreneurs on stage. I know that neither of your companies started in China. Both are very successful now. And Constantine, you have a really interesting story. You didn't even intend in going into China, but ultimately it worked out and it become one of the most profitable parts of your operation. So tell us about it. Okay, so we, um, we intended to build the diapers.com model for Europe. 
um, selling diapers, baby food uh, to mothers in Europe, and then cross-sell into other uh, baby products like gates, monitors, car seats, and so on. And this business is now in 10 countries in Europe. Uh, we went public in 2015, uh, made two acquisitions, all good. And, and along the way, uh, we saw 2011, we started 2010. So 2011, we saw Chinese customers buying on our website, primarily baby food, and then having it delivered to German addresses. And we said, wait a minute, this is something's happening here. Mm -hmm. uh, and we said, but the business as it is, we're not going to make money because with those, those customers, you cannot cross sell into other baby products because they want baby food and baby milk uh, uh, mostly. So we said, okay, but, but it's a huge opportunity, so we have to manage it. And then what we did is we introduced split pricing. If you come from, from a Chinese IP address, you pay higher prices. Uh, we then introduced Alipay. Um, we, introduce, we have a customer service uh, in Vietnam with Chinese people in Vietnam now. Uh, we then introduced a direct delivery to China before they were delivering to German addresses, Chinese people in Germany that did the logistics. And the last step was last year we opened on Tmall. So we have now a, um, a big Tmall store. So we didn't, so we are not really in China. Yes, we have an employee now in China, we have an office in China, but we do the cross-border business. Uh, and as you said, it's, it's very successful. Our Tmall store, I was just with uh, Alibaba yesterday, our Tmall store was, was voted one of the biggest uh, Tmall stores on Tmall Global. Mm -hmm. So uh, on the way, we discovered a business, uh, which is now a big part of our business, a very profitable part of our business, where we are very happy that, that it came upon us without us selecting it at the beginning. It worked out that way. And you were telling me that a lot of your products are stored in China's FTZs and warehouses. So when your customers buy these products online, it will be shipped, in, shipped to them the next day. So it's really like buying local products. There's really no gap anymore. That's correct, just not yet with us. Okay. Because maybe when you come to your other questions, what are the challenges? Right. Um, we, we are working on a local warehouse okay. uh, and, or a bonded warehouse. It's not up to uh, the, the problem is that, but I come to you that later when you ask right. the other questions. We would have it a long time ago, right. but then you have to also talk to suppliers in Germany, right. and they might have a different opinion. So it's going to happen when that it's happens. Going happen. Everything will be smooth It's going to happen, sailing. and then we give the customer a choice: Do you want to have it from a German warehouse? You wait longer, I you see. pay more for shipping, or you want to have it from a bonded warehouse? That's something we're working on. Perfect. I already seen that example of shopping on Taobao. Yeah. But, but a lot of stores yeah. do offer that option. Yeah. And now my next question is for Jim. We know that your company didn't start in China, but right now, one of other China's tech giants, not Baidu, but the other one, became your primary investor. So tell us about your China story. Sure, so I, I can't actually claim to be an entrepreneur, but um, for us, um, uh, we're a Finnish uh, company at heart, a mobile games company. Um, so everything that we do is primarily online and digital. Uh, we have been operating in China, publishing our games since 2014. Uh, before we actually entered the market, we did a lot of work in terms of researching, understanding what player habits were like, what kind of gameplay that they liked, did that match with the games that we made, and also really understanding the distribution channels. Because for mobile, uh, the mobile environment, the app environment in China, it's extremely complex. Android, the Android market, is not like it is in the West. Um, there are over, you know, there are actually literally, you know, tens of hundreds, oh, hundreds of actually Android apps. So, app stores. So for us, we really had to study that. Um, I think just to boil it down quickly, in terms of some of the key lessons that we've actually learned entering into China, uh, it is really important for uh, for mobile gaming companies to find a great partner. Uh, again, because of the complexities around um, uh, distribution. So, uh, in this case, uh, you know, we publish uh, with Tencent and also a, another publisher called Kunlun. I think it's very important to have a very strong local team, so, a team that actually grew up in this part of the world who culturally really understands um, this part of the world, uh, someone who, a team that really understands the local ecosystem, the relationships between the internet giants because mm -hmm. they obviously have motives, their own motives, and they actually influence a lot of the ecosystem here. Uh, a real understanding of local regulations, which I think Daisy mentioned, um, is very important for a censored industry like uh, it is for media. And then really just uh, local marketing strategies. Uh, that for us has become, is, is very important. And what I mean by that is 
uh, in, including uh, the creatives that we create. So, you know, we obviously do a lot of ads uh, in, in the West, but being able to actually concept them here in China that uh, plays here, people here really understand, uh, that's been really important. And I think the last thing is just, uh, a, you know, our product is a game. Uh, and so uh, having local products uh, is, is really important because Chinese gamers are very different to Western gamers. That's right. um, and you know, that's a whole other topic, but um, uh, yeah. Definitely hedging regulatory risks and understanding local culture seems to be part of recipe for success um, giving and doing business in China. My, my next question will go back to the investors. I understand that there seems to be this popular concept uh, in Silicon Valley that perhaps we are uh, heading towards another burst of the tech bubble. A lot of tech companies fundamentally does not make money yet, but they have multi-billion dollar valuations, Snapchat being one of the examples that certainly had a, a big correction when it comes to its share price. And also, unfortunately, a lot of new generation of Chinese entrepreneurs, uh, when they start a business, there is a very common wanting is that I just need to get to the C round of, you know, fundraising. And then after that, I'm catching out. My company becomes someone else's problem. So my question for Christina is that as an investor, when you're looking at, when you're looking at business in China, how do you wield out the people who are just in the market and doing the hottest thing and in it for a quick buck against those people who have a real passion for their company and the business, the real people you want to invest in? For me, the key word is competitive advantage. Um, in fact, uh, we invest in mostly Western companies in Europe and the US, um, but not a lot of them obviously are looking at China as their expansion, as part of their expansion strategy. And to, uh, China, even globally, is probably one of the most competitive market. And for any business to, and, and any entrepreneur to operate here and really succeed, uh, is com sustained competitive advantage that we are looking for. And that could be coming, uh, quite often come in the form of rich IP, very differentiated products. Business model innovation could potentially work within domestic market, but come actually exporting it from or importing it from somewhere else into China is a lot harder because actually China is in innovating a lot faster in terms of business model, especially on consumer front. So actually what we look for is a lot of deep tech, sort of artificial intelligence, but in, in a more um, specialized vertical areas, robotics, um, virtual reality, et cetera. These areas are really hot in China right now, not they only are. China, but other countries as well. So my next question for Daisy is that in terms of investing in artificial intelligence, robotics, or these very tech-heavy sectors, I mean, China has become a hot space for tech investments. And, but we're also facing the problem that a lot of these companies we don't really have a profitable model yet, but how do you identify whether this company it just built on acquiring a massive user base using raised funds, or this company actually has a viable future to be profitable one day? Yeah. How do you make that distinction? It is a real problem uh, in China right now. So um, when we look at startup companies, we tend to for the earlier stage, like seed or series A round, we probably back the um, good entrepreneurs, either top engineers or product managers. They understand what they're doing. And also, they have an innovation idea. We see what problems they're solving. But for the more matured uh, companies later stage that we need to see their business model, can it be profitable one day? You mm -hmm. can't be like forever like this, right? Mm -hmm. So we invest in. Um, core technology companies. We also try to strike a balance between technology and the commercialization of it. So there's, um, you, you have to consider the business model at the same time and see if their technology does have any special things. Mm -hmm. So we, um, Baidu Venture is a, a standalone independent venture capital fund. We strive to build a portfolio that is within our expertise in artificial intelligence, big data, enterprise software, IoT, you know, smart homes, connected cars, in all these um, familiar areas that we want to, um, this portfolio puts us in the top tier VC category. So our, our team is mostly from people either from a tech background or entrepreneurial background. For myself, I worked in Silicon Valley before 
Um, I, I was in Goldman here, Hong Kong, in their tech um, private equity team. Uh, one of my partner, uh, he used to be an internet uh, internet uh, entrepreneur who founded company and and sold the company. So we have a diverse background team, and uh, so I want to position the fund as a you know um, return seeking, but also leverage the a lot of resources to to help the entrepreneurs grow. That's our goal. Mm -hmm. And Christina brought up a really good point. You're saying that China has 1.3 billion consumers. It's a massive market, but certainly that you can't just pick up gold on the floor. It is not easy to make money in China. Yeah. And given that two entrepreneurs on stage, you both had experiences operating in China. My question to you is that what's the biggest challenge you've faced so far? Let's start with Jimmy. Yeah, for us, it's really around uh, distribution. You know, when you think about the mobile games business, it's fundamentally about how do you connect your product, which is our game, with end players, right? Um, in this day and age, I think uh, gamers have a lot of choice. Um, uh, it's very hard to actually stay even in you know the top three, top ten uh, of uh, kind of you know the app store rankings. Um, and China, for us, when we think about our global business, everywhere else we're working with you know Google Play or iOS, but in China, as I mentioned, we have iOS and then we have uh, all these uh, app stores that are, uh, some of them are controlled by internet giants like, you know, 360 Chihu or Beidou, uh, and then the rest uh, are managed by phone manufacturers like Xiaomi, Huawei, Oppo, and so uh, for us to actually... Uh, as an extremely small team, so our company, we have a philosophy where we like to have very small teams. Globally, we're only 220 people. China, we're only seven people. To manage all those app stores um, uh, is, is extremely complex. And actually getting those app stores to promote our games, to give us featuring, mm -hmm. uh, it's a very tedious type job, which is, you know, goes to the point of why we work with partners. So it's specific China-related problem. Correct. Given, I see. And now I know Constantine wanted to talk about this before. Before, it seems to be one of the biggest hurdles your company is facing right now. After you overcome that hurdle, your business will boom onto a different, another different level. So tell us about this biggest challenge you're facing, and do you have a, 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 a idea how to solve that problem yet? Yeah. It's, it's, it's funny because the biggest challenge is not probably not what you would expect, um, at least in our business. I mean, the, the Chinese customers, um, if you give them the authentic product at a good price with a good service, they're very loyal, they're demanding, but very loyal. So from that point of view, it's not that difficult or not that remote. The biggest challenge is actually to get your own, like what Christina said, your own organization in Germany behind this business. Because for them, it's remote. Mm -hmm. So uh, just an easy example. Our website used to be pretty slow when you exited from China. Um, it took like sometimes, depending on the day, it took like up to a minute until the, the page loaded. Of course, it's a disaster then um, I'm surprised people still bought uh, our <laughs> website. Uh, but then in Germany, people sit in the office, access our website, and they say, well, they, you know, you don't feel the pain because yep. it, it's quick. So you have to convince them. You have to show a, a video of, of our employee in China accessing the website, and it takes some time. So to get your organization behind this, this really interesting, profitable business is, I think, the biggest challenge. And coming back to the point before, it's also not just the organization, it's also your suppliers. Mm -hmm. Because the suppliers, for them, it's like, oh, you're selling our products to China, why do you do that? We have our own Im importer in China, uh, we don't want to step on the toes of, the, of, of our Chinese business, and so forth. So also that takes some time until you convince them that it's actually a very good business for them as well. So that's the biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. I guess e-commerce, cross-border e-commerce in particular, is still a relatively foreign concept in the West, where in China, it seems yeah. like, I've Everybody is using it. So my last question, we have a little bit of time left. I want to give it to uh, our two investors who both worked in Silicon Valley and then working in China. Uh, Christina, I know that you worked for a VC fund abroad and then now you exclusively invest in China. So first question, Daisy, briefly tell us, what's the biggest difference between working in Silicon Valley and Beijing's Zhongguanzhen, China Silicon Valley? Um. Well, to me, I'm insensitive about the region, so I don't uh -huh. feel particular. Um, did, well, in Beijing, the traffic is very bad, so <laughs> budget your time wisely. You can't do like four meetings a day. But Silic Make sure you take but the But Silicon train. Valley is the same way. I just came back from there and driving is uh, unpleasant over there. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Yeah. I see, not Christina. Yeah. 
Um, actually, a lot of differences, especially also I spend quite a lot of time in Europe, and the gap between Europe and China is much bigger than the gap between US and China, I'd say. A mm -hmm. um, couple things that just spring to mind. One is mentality, the speed, the speed of execution, uh, the drive is much, uh, is much bigger in, in China compared to, in, compared to Europe. Mm -hmm. For sure. So we see a lot of tech companies actually started this dual headquarters strategy where it have a headquarter in Silicon Valley, another headquarter in Beijing to take the advantage of the best of both worlds. Well, thank you very much. And hopefully our discussion makes China a little less scary for you to enter for your next venture. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you so much for our panel panelists on stage. Thank you.